stood up for the women too. We have certain folks around here who think that they're God. And they forget that they didn't read the Bible right. That Old Testament book, the first book, where it stated a little story involving who? Adam and Eve. And the book says they had a choice. They were created in the divine image, but they were not made robots. They were given a mind to think and to use their heads for more than a hat rack, <laughs> but to make sure that they would be critical thinkers and make right decisions for their benefit and welfare and for the benefit and welfare of all human beings. But you know, they got the message that when we blow it and make wrong turns, bad decisions, we all suffer the consequence. So that's why Michael Pappas, Amos Brown, and real prophetic representatives of the best of spirituality said that a woman has the right to decide what she would do with her own body and nobody should tell her what she didn't do. So we're in good company here tonight. And we thank God that we have Third Baptist here. Let all the members of Third Baptist community please stand, led by our leader of our deacons of ministry, Alfonso Campbell and <laughs> Preston Turner of our trustee ministry. Now let all the friends of Third Baptist and Temple Emmanuel please stand that we may applaud you too. Amen. From all the organizations that we represent. <laughs> and tonight I could not be engaged with you without inviting you to please Pray for our matriarch of the movement for peace, justice, equality, and love that we embrace. Rita Simmel, 101 years old. She would have been here tonight, but we are connected with her spirit, and we assure her that wherever she is viewing this great assemblage, she will feel our continuous love for her and respect for her great labors. Well, tonight I won't hold you very long, and I will not involve myself and you in hearing oratory and words. In the tradition of the old rabbi, I just want to read a passage of scripture. For there was a rabbi called Jesus of Nazareth who went to his hometown where he had been reared and as the guest rabbi that Sabbath morn, it says, Brother Preston, he stood up to read. And tonight, in that tradition, I am going to read the text of his first inaugural sermon. For we all have heard it time after time. But tonight, in the tradition of the rabbi, 
Rabbi Singer, I am going to read, and you will discover what I will do when I do it. <laughs> In the Gospel of Luke, it says, according to Eugene Peterson's translation of the Holy Bible, He came to Nazareth where he had been reared, and as he always did on the Sabbath, he went into the meeting place. When he stood up to read, he was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written. God's Spirit is on me. He's chosen me to preach the message of good news to the poor. Sent me to announce pardon to prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind. To set the burdened and battered free. To announce this is God's year to act. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the assistant, and he sat down. I'm going to sit down. <laughs> and tonight, I am going to, like the rabbi, hopefully have something to say that will engage us all and we will preach this sermon tonight together. You just heard these beautiful singers sing that banner hymn of the civil rights movement. We shall overcome. But not many of us know how this song came to be. We sing it. We've given concerts and arrangements of that great hymn. But let the rabbi acquaint you with the fact that that hymn was written by an enslaved black man named Charles Albert Tinley. He wrote it in 1901 at a time of great crisis in this nation. He had an interesting origin, beginning, and career as a preacher. Born on the eastern shore of Maryland into hard enslavement as a young boy. And at the age of 17, he could not read nor write. But he had God with him and his family. His father was still alive, but his mother died in his tender years. Charles Albert Tinley had a passion for knowing, for knowledge, and he was an inquisitive young 17-year-old. But at 17, he wended his way up to Philadelphia, and he worked as a hard carrier by day in order that brick buildings would be built in Philadelphia. And by night, he took a correspondence course, and he mastered Greek Arabic and Hebrew before he died in 1933. He wrote a hymn. This world is one great battlefield with forces all array. If in my heart I do not yield, I'll overcome someday. And that hymn that many knew who gathered in Highlander Folk School 
in Tennessee, down there near where Preston Turner came from, at Mine Eagle, when they were gathered there with Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, somebody said, we need a hymn, we need a song that will inspire us and embolden us when we go to face pit bulldogs and hound dogs and the hoses of Bull Corner. And so they said, uh, what shall we choose as our hymn? And old Pete Singer, that great folk singer and guitarist, start humming and strumming the melodies of that hymn. And he transposed it and gave us that beautiful song that was so greatly sung a few minutes ago. But I say to you, will we really overcome? With all of the division that's in America, with all of the alternative facts that irritate us day by day, will we really overcome in this nation? in the midst of homophobia, xenophobia. Will we really make it in this country when a man who told more lies, even though the truth would be in his favor, was recently the president of the United States of America? Will we ever overcome to get rid of sexism too? Will we overcome to get rid of nationalism? Will we overcome and really experience a beloved community? Well, we got a long ways to go. And I'm now, thank God, 81, going on 82. And I ain't tired yet. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But I'm going to sit down and tell you something. <laughs> Listen. Jesus sat down and told them what he would do. And his brother James, in the book of James, the first chapter says, be ye doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. I could have easily preached a sermon tonight. I don't want us to have a whole lot of hallelujah. I want us to experience some do hallelujah. <laughs> Why do we need do hallelujah? It's because I came here tonight with a heavy heart. I came in tonight because two things were foremost in my mind. One, the other day you all saw it, that a person over in Jackson Square in this town was doing something that did not represent the greatest law. And what was that great law? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And the second half of it all is, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You saw it, and honor of an art gallery, took a water hose and hosed down a woman, a black woman. It was wrong if it was any woman. And that took me back to the days when Bull Corner in Birmingham, Alabama, turns fire hoses on black students, elders, and children. Why? Because he didn't have 
love in his heart. He had fear and hate in his heart. Somebody said people tend to hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they do not know each other. And they do not know each other because of a lack of communication. But thank God now, Third Baptist and Temple Emmanuel, we have gotten to know each other for 36 years and we are saying to the world, we ain't going to let nobody turn us around and stop us from coming together as blacks and Jews and as people of different backgrounds and experiences because we better, as Dr. Martin Luther King said eloquently, learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we are all going to perish as fools in the United States of America. So we need to be doers of the word to make sure that we change the trajectory and that we give every citizen of this city the kind of spirit that causes us to respect all women, respect all human beings, for indeed that's what Dr. King, my teacher, taught me. I sat down with Dr. King at Morehouse College. And in 1961, 62 semesters, I was chosen to be one of the only eight students that he taught in his lifetime. And in that class in social philosophy, what did I learn among many things? I learned something about the theory that he acquired up at Boston University called personalism. Personalism that came from Dr. Brightman. And what is personalism? Every human being is a person imbued with dignity and nobody has a right to insult the personhood of another human being. That man in North Beach, I wish he were here tonight, and we would give him some restorative justice, and he would just fess up, say that he's sorry, and make sure that he never turn a hose on another woman are any of God's children. That's what San Francisco got to do. And how can we do it? How can we have some dual lawyer in our spirituality, in our rituals? By making sure that we have a program in this town that's action oriented and that we will stop analyzing and studying about homelessness. We will stop just pushing the envelope down the road or kicking the can. But we realize that homelessness or being without a house is everybody's business. And anybody who's out of a house need to be helped to get ready to take care of a house. We have too many, far too many homeless people who have unfortunately there are mental challenges. There are emotional challenges. But what happened? A certain man who left the earth and went to wherever he ended up. Our former governor, Reagan, you know what he did? You know that edict he gave? Closed down all of the mental institutions. Some of them needed to be closed down because they were, didn't show personalhood and personalism with dealing with people who had mental illnesses. But we didn't carry out the plan. What was that plan? In every local community, there would be county and citywide facilities. But we flubbed it 
we didn't do it. And now we suffer the embarrassing consequence of a video going around the globe of a man who was so irate, so upset, that he turned on a hose and insulted the humanity of a black woman. We got to do something about that. We got to do something about it. And already the NACP and I are going to join with the city of San Francisco and appeal the decision of that judge who was not thinking the other day who said that in San Francisco, no homeless person who's living in an unhealthy, dangerous situation can be moved by any of us in a loving way. Beloved, that's insanity. We have locked up the wrong people. And some of us need to be blocked up with our reductionist thinking that's not balanced. For we need balanced thinking that says we're going to help people are homeless or without house. We're going to feed them. We're going to clothe them. We're going to give them medical attention. We're going to make sure that they have that kind of case-managed therapeutic help. But for those who can't take care of themselves, who need tender love and care, is our moral obligation to sit down like Jesus and say the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And we're going to do something about giving holistic services to every homeless person in this city. Finally, the rabbi was a great student, and he sat at the feet of some rabbi. But I'm sad to say, finally, that in San Francisco, my heart was heavy tonight, because in the schools of this city, middle schools, what do we have happening? And I call the names tonight. At Aptus, I call the names tonight. Over at Marina, young people are bullying. Young people are cutting class. Young people are roaming up and down the halls. And they ought to be going to school and saying, in the words of Chaucer, gladly will I learn and gladly will I teach others how to find the way to the good life. But Brother Michael, we don't have enough rabbis and we don't have enough teachers and educators who know how to be culturally, culturally sensitive and know how to say to all children, you came here to learn. And in this school, in my class, I'm in charge. I'm going to love you, but you're not going to terrorize and bully another student. My friends, if we don't, our inertia and our inaction will cause us to have another unfortunate situation. And then we end up saying, my prayers and thoughts are with you. It's time for us to stop praying and having thoughts and to get up and do something about public education so that every parent will send his or her child to school and they will know that they are in a safe, secure, atmosphere where God is watching them to be a student on the way to becoming a scholar. 
God bless you. This is it tonight. Brother Amos says, we have a job to let nobody stop us from supporting back on track. It's too much that's been done. We have been able through that tutorial and mentoring program, send young people on to medical school, send them on to become lawyers, sending them on to become engineers. And we are about a great work. And we are indeed those persons who will be used by God to fulfill Dr. Martin Luther King's vision of a one beloved community, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants will be able to say, we are in safe space and we have created Dr. King's dream in a fulfilled fashion. To God be praised, thank you tonight. And if anyone wants to have some dialogue with the rabbi, before we adjourn, I will fill your questions and entertain them so that we shall indeed, as you all say, overcome the mess that we are in. And God is not pleased with it. But we can get a reprieve and we can get a good grade and pass the course. For if we don't get our lessons and pass the course, we're going to repeat the grade and be sent back. God bless you.